Well, good morning, everyone. And let me add my welcome to you on this wonderful summit. Um, Doppler touches probably each one of you, one way or another, be it your cardiologist, surgeon, sonographer, technician, because nowadays, this is how we evaluate hemodynamics. Uh, when I trained, uh, Doppler was in, in its infancy. We had M mode and 2D, and everything had to go through the catheterization laboratory to figure out what cardiac output is, uh, and certainly what valve area is. So now that you rely quite a bit on Doppler to evaluate valvular heart disease, I really think it's important to have a discussion because it is technically driven, it is very powerful, but technically driven. And if we don't understand what the basics are for Doppler evaluation, I think we could be in for some surprises. And I think this is where the pressure is on your echocardiography laboratory to get it right. And, uh, and to be also, uh, for, I'm talking here to the echocardiographers, is to be transparent with your physician as to if there are some technical issues to relay that to them because most of the decisions are based as a first line on echo Doppler and maybe other imaging modalities or even catheterization laboratory to go forward. But I think this is very important. Now, echo Doppler has really evolved into a family of technologies that are very powerful, can give us a lot about cardiac structure and function and hemodynamics and valve regurgitation and valve stenosis. And I think this is what the topic is. So what I'd like to take you within the next 15 minutes is how can we use this to help the clinician and the surgeon make a diagnosis? Yes, it can tell us about velocity and direction, instantaneous real-time gradients, which is very powerful, cardiac output, estimation of pulmonary pressure and diastolic function. And the last one, we're not going to go really through it. This is not to scare you this morning. This is the Doppler equation. And all what I want to say about the Doppler equation is there is a factor of an angle. And if we don't have a good angulation, meaning parallel to flow, you will underestimate what the frequency shift and what the velocity is. And therefore, throw a wrench into your calculations of either gradient or valve area, etc. So for the sonographers in the audience, if they're here, and the echocardiographer, we know that, that you want to make sure that you're not angulated and therefore keep that angle less than 20 and basically have multiple windows from which to acquire these velocities and therefore gradients and, and flow. Now, this is very powerful because with Doppler and combining it with echocardiographic measurement, you can come up with output, a cardiac output, a systemic output, a regurgitant volume, regurgitant fraction. That's how you calculate valve area because in valve area, there is the component of flow, there's component of the gradient, what the velocity is through the So outputs are being calculated without you knowing if you're not in the field, but uh, this is very important. And you can calculate it at the annulus of the aortic valve, uh, at the annulus of the mitral valve, and you know understand what flows are. Stenosis. Well, obviously, with a, an increasing in narrowing of a certain valve, there is a change in velocity across it. And this is from a classic of Liv Hatley, who was, quote unquote, the mother of Doppler echocardiography, still lives in Spain now. And notice that with increasing severity of aortic stenosis, these velocities across the valve increase, and the shape also changes. Peak velocity becomes later and later in systole which goes along with what we usually you know, feel by pulse examination. This is pulses tardus, right? And the ejection time increases. So although these are qualitative, these can, can help you tremendously going forward. And how we measure or, or estimate a pressure gradient is using a modified Bernoulli equation by a very simplified you know, portion of that Bernoulli equation, 4v squared. So if the velocity across the aortic valve is 4 meters, it's 4 times 4 squared, is 64 millimeters of mercury, that would be the maximal you know, pressure gradient across it. This is the simplification of this you know, quite complex Bernoulli equation. And the reason for it is most discrete stenosis, like a mitral stenosis, aortic stenosis, 
The flow acceleration is not an issue. Viscous friction is not much of an issue. And therefore, this is, you know, the simplification of it. Let's talk a little bit about aortic stenosis. Obviously, it comes in different flavors, different etiologies, and uh, from a bicuspid to, you know, the rheumatic, which is much less in this country, uh, quite prevalent in other countries. And the, uh, the one on, on the right is, uh, uh, right lower is uh, calcific aortic stenosis, where you can see the nodules being, you know, quite a bit in the cusp themselves. Importantly, talking about Doppler here, these are the early data from uh, Rick Nishimura and the Mayo Clinic telling us that instantaneously, if you do catheterization and Doppler measurement, you know, they, re they really track on. But for the hemodynamicist who is in the catheterization laboratory, we grew up early on on this peak-to-peak -peak gradient because we didn't have simultaneous catheterizations. So you put a catheter in the ventricle and pull back and basically see this maximal gradient in the aorta and maximal gradient in the aorta here and the maximal gradient in the left ventricle. But these are not simultaneous gradients. They occur at a different point of time. And the actual instantaneous gradient occurs earlier, just like seen here in the dashed arrow. And this is initially was the difference between the language of what the Doppler hemodynamicist would, would talk about and the catheterization person is. And therefore, if you compared, even in the early days, maximal gradient by catheter versus peak-to-peak -peak gradient, you know, there, there, is a, there is a difference. But for us to speak the same language, you look at mean gradients, mean gradient by Doppler and mean gradient by catheterization, and they should be quite, quite similar in both of them. I talked about angulation. For us to be able to really feel comfortable that indeed this gradient is reflective of the true gradient in aortic stenosis, Sonographers have to look at various windows from the apical, subcostal, suprasternal, etc., and measure the highest velocity and therefore the one that is the least angulation. And this is important because no matter what you do, be it calculation a valve area, calculation of a mean gradient, it will affect it. And we do a valve area calculation. Uh, because it's much less dependent on flow. It's not, not uh, you know, there's always some dependency on valve area on flow, but certainly it will help you tremendously if you think about a valve area, particularly in lower flow conditions. And this is how it affects you if you have a, you know, if you, if you have a different windows with different, you know, maximal gradients, it will affect your Doppler area calculation uh, from 0.9 to down to 0.7. So, you know, attention to detail would be really very important. And these are, to tell you the truth, this is comparison, historical comparison between validation in the early days, in the early 80s, uh, experience here at Houston Methodist versus the Mayo Clinic, it's identical. It really is identical. And you see a much more scatter in the milder portion of aortic stenosis as opposed to the tighter portion. Believe it or not, it's not because of the Doppler issue. It's because of the Gorlin equation problem. Gordon equation falls apart when the mean gradient gets very small and then you have low flow area. Uh, variability. It's very important for us to think about variability of, of measurements. And the reason for it is to calculate a valve area, there are three components. The diameter in the LV outflow tract, pulse Doppler in the LV outflow tract, and continuous wave Doppler. And in our experience, the most robust and the most reproducible is the mean gradient and maximal velocity through. The others can give you, so you want to take a look at the three components besides just looking at valve area and gradient and see if you're following somebody over time that, you know, take a look at each component, make sure it's not a technical issue, make sure it's really real and at times review the study. And this is data from our institution here that this is, you know, the confidence limit that you see there is about 0.2, that's 95%. So realistically, if I measure somebody in area of 0.1 today and measure this individual again tomorrow, you know, the variability is easy between 0.1 centimeter squared. So a 0.9 could be a 0.8, could be a 1. And I think this is very realistic. And this is in a, in a lab that is quite experienced. So you can see that, you know, those changes can be quite important down the line when you're looking at, you know, progression. And this is, I'll give you an example here of a patient of mine looked at progression from 2006 to 2000, within three years, you know, the velocity increased from three to 4.5, and obviously the valve area, you know, gradually went down, started to get symptomatic, obviously you, you, you intervene. So for aortic stenosis, 
we're going to look not only at the valve area and, and, uh, and uh, what the flows are, but also what are the accommodations of the ventricle to the pressure overload state. You know, the ventricle start can start falling apart. If you have low flow situations, you may want to increase flow, and these are part of the recommendations of the guideline. You infuse some dobutamine. It doesn't have to be maximal stress, but at least look at contractile reserve and see what happened to the valve area here in this individual. Valve area stayed tight, obviously mean graded increased, and you feel much more comfortable that indeed this is severe aortic stenosis. One thing that we see in our laboratory is not everything that has a gradient is aortic stenosis. You could have a subaortic membrane, you could have a supravalvular stenosis, you could have dynamic obstruction. So keep those in mind just to make sure, because in the older individual, you may still have dynamic obstruction on top of somebody with calcific aortic stenosis. At times, it's very difficult to differentiate these gradients, but gotta be careful about that. Few thoughts regarding mitral stenosis, easier overall to, to evaluate, but remember here that mean gradient is very dependent on heart rate, very dependent very different than aortic stenosis. So whenever you report a mean gradient, always report heart rate with it. Same principle applies, increase in velocity across the mitral stenosis, which gets more and more severe. And you could see the slope is lesser and lesser over time. This is the principle of this pressure half time. It takes time for the pressure to equalize between the atrium and the ventricle, which tells you something about the aortic stenosis, I mean the mitral stenosis. You also look at the gradient, valve area, but also look at pulmonary pressure because this is very important. And here, this is an individual valve area of 1.1, PA pressure about 55, certainly significant aortic stenosis. For the invasive cardiologist and non-invasive, if you have actually a mean gradient by, cat, by Doppler is probably nowadays, unless you do a transeptal technique, is probably better than catheterization. And the reason for it is you don't have the issue of angulation. You may have, if you do some retrograde, meaning pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, et cetera, there may be some pulmonary venous hypertension, or you may not be wedging it well. So you can overestimate at times the gradient at catheterization. Now, obviously, the best is to go through a transeptal technique, which we don't usually do for diagnostic purposes. But I think if there are some issues, certainly can be done. And this is the pressure halftime formula. Very simple, simplistic. Uh, can go wrong in about 20% of the time. And the reason for it, it really depends on what happens to the gradient between ventricle and, uh, and atrium. And I can see a lot of issues, you know, from, you know, echoes from the outside. Now, these are no-nos on the right side. You cannot use pressure halftime when you have a monophasic or when you have a slope, almost like a ski slope on the right side of, uh, I mean, you cannot use that. So it is about fault is about 20% of the time of pressure half time. So you have to think about other continuity equations, other things. And the pressure half time was validated in younger individuals with rheumatic mitral valve. So they, they don't have usually diastolic difficulties. But nowadays we use it for the older individual who have relaxation issues and you will, you know, your estimation could be much, uh, much more off. And that's why we use the continuity equation. This is a case in, in point. Pressure half time tells me valve area is 0.8, but mitral valve continuity equation is it's almost two. So again, this is for the ultra, you know, for the sonographer and for the echocardiographer, hopefully to help the clinician going forward. And uh, at times you may have discrepancy. I have a you know smaller air valve uh, gradient, and yet the pressure is on the higher side, and the atrium is huge. Is this really related to severity of mitral stenosis? And whenever you have discrepancies like this, obviously you could do a bicycle exercise and look at the hemodynamics. And that's what we did in this individual. So you could see that, you know, there was mild mitral regurgitation and you exercise this individual and take a look at the hemodynamics. And indeed the hemodynamics during exercise on a bicycle, uh, the PA pressure went to 76, yet only the mean gradient despite exercise was seven. So you know that pulmonary hypertension is really not necessarily related to the severity of mitral stenosis. This is where it can really help you nowadays. So in conclusion, what I went uh, over this morning with you is where are the Doppler assessment that can help us in hemodynamics? Yes, we can look at gradients, we can look at multiple sites, but at the same time, we have to be vigilant as to some of the pitfalls 
that Doppler echocardiography could have. So you as a clinician would take a look at this and try to reconcile some of these differences going forward. Doppler hemodynamics, and this is for Dr. Little himself, uh, because last year he gave us a, a, a title that uh, was rough. So we told him that indeed it is a workhorse with smooth, shiny skin. Thank you very much.